and they're like talking loudly about all these things that they're doing. They're giving out their passwords over the phone, and it's annoying. I used to have business cards printed up that would be basically said, kindly shut the F up, and you would hand it to these people, and uh, they, they would shut up. But I found another way to get them to shut up. I started taking this picture, and I had to do it like five, six times, because it wasn't like put right, it was kept on, off, kilter. So I had to take it like six times. And I noticed that people kept leaving around me. They were just like, oh, fuck this, I'm out. And, um, and uh, finally, this very nice lady from the United Red Carpet Club came up, and she's like, excuse me, sir, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine! <laughs> and and she, she ran away, and that, was, that made me sad at that point. But that's my picture. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about before we get started is bad luck. I had uh, my brother called me up, and he's like, dude, could you explain this bad luck vulnerability? Apparently it's like on the news, and it's a really big deal. I'm like, okay, here, here's bad luck in a nutshell. Do you remember Christmas? He's like, yeah, I remember Christmas. Christmas was awesome. Remember we go down, and, and there would be like a Christmas present there? He's like, yeah, Christmas presents were great. Well, imagine opening up that Christmas present, finding a turd in it. <laughs> And then dad would get drunk and beat us. <laughs> he was like, it's a lot like that. He's like, oh, okay, so it's, it isn't what you expected it to be? No, not in the slightest. Um, so let's go through how I do this. Now this whole entire presentation has morphed over the years to incorporate what I'm interested in right now. Um, what are the things that we're actually spending a lot of time and effort on as far as breaking stuff at uh, Black Hills Information Security. A couple of quick things. Uh, this is brought to you by SANS 504, Hacker Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Response. And if you really love incoherent ramblings of me talking like this for an hour, you're like, I'd like to listen to that guy for six days. You're a horrible human being. Uh, you need new hobbies. You shouldn't listen to me. Uh, but SANS 504 is a great class. Check it out. Um, it's also Black Hills Information Security. We do this stuff, and that is my better pitch. All right, so first up, if I'm going to target an organization and I want to be successful, without question, I am going to target your users. But this shouldn't be a surprise to any of you at all. I mean, whenever we do phishing campaigns, we actually have to try to get the percentage of the people that click the freaking link less than 20%. We've sent in phishing campaigns to organizations that say, in the subject, this is a phishing campaign. <laughs> Once you get into the text, it reads, do not click the link. If you click the link, you fail. They still click the link at a rate of about 20%. And you know what people in the organization click the link more than anybody? Security people who bring MacBook Airs to presentations. <laughs> That's who. It's 100% of the user population. They click the link. So in that population, who else do we actually have? We have people like Granny Max. <laughs> Granny Max loves to gamble. She loves polka dots. She likes anything with polka in it. She thinks the CD tray is a coaster. She collects gnomes. What the hell does that have to do with anything? It's building a profile. It's a mnemonic device, okay? You'll never forget this. And she's bypassing your outbound web filters by using a third-party anonymizing proxy. Hmm. Which of these things is not like the other? Which of these things doesn't belong? Okay, so how the hell is Granny Max doing this? We're gonna come back to this here in just a couple of seconds, but Granny Max's account's doing some really amazing thing for a, for a lady that thinks the CD tray is a, is a coaster. And we also have Phil from Accounting. He works with numbers and terabytes of porn. <laughs> He has a slight problem. He actually doesn't get along with Granny Max. Now, a little bit of background information as far as why Phil and Granny Max don't get along with each other. Granny Max loves cats, like, a lot. She has a whole bunch of them. They crap in her corners, and the crap gets hard over time, and kids come over and they try to eat it. It's not good. But Granny Max really likes cats, all right? Phil hates cats. A lot. He actually started up a Facebook group um, called I Hate Cats and They Should All Die. And, and in the group, they sold a disposable cat. It was a cat that came with its own plastic bag. And, and Granny Max didn't think that that was funny at all. So they, they argued over this incessantly. Once again, what the hell does this have to do with this presentation? I'm filling time. That's what I'm doing. I'm just filling time. And he's bypassing your filtering using an SSH tunnel through his home computer system. Once again, Phil doesn't know what the hell that is. Granny Max doesn't know what, what a web proxy is. She doesn't have any freaking clue. But somehow these people are doing these amazing things. 
and you're an average user. The other people that I'm going to attack, they don't gamble at work. They don't surf porn at work. They like Facebook, YouTube, politics, eBay, Googling, Fantasy Football, Farm, Drudge Report, Huffington Post, CNN, Amazon, and they dislike web filters. Now, how many of you at work have people that bypass web filters, they get caught, and then, whenever you confront them, you're like, you were bypassing our web filters. And they're like, well, I was able to do it, so it must be okay. <laughs> and how many of you in security, and a little bit in the back of your head, you're like, that guy's got a good point, actually. <laughs> It's not bad, actually. I mean, you know what? We should probably think about hiring this guy because the pen test pool is horrible right now. <laughs> it's just awful. I ask a three-way handshake question to people. I say, I sent you a sin. How do you respond? They're like, uh, open? <laughs> and then they argue with you when you tell them you're wrong. You're like, yeah, that's not right. I'm pretty sure that that's right. It's like, no, you're freaking wrong. And by the way, if you're good at what you do, just, just so you know, in the, in the world of information security, if you're good at what you do from a job perspective, and you're miserable at work, it's your own damn fault. I don't want to explain why. If you're at work and you're insecure, you're like, I hate my job, my commute's an hour and a half long. Oh my god, I hate it here. Move. Get another job. You can. It's that type of market. We were talking about this earlier. You can get another job easily. If you're like, yeah, I, I, know, I know regular expressions. You're a god in this industry. <laughs> you know, you're just like, oh my god, he walks on water. He bypassed AV. Oh my god. He knows assembly. And his, and his VGA cable worked. And then it stopped working. My computer seems to be just fine. There we go, I shook the cable. So if you see me like shaking my crotch, <laughs> it's not awkward, I'm just shaking my, I'm shaking this cable, and you're not helping, okay? You're not helping whatsoever, all right? All right, so whenever we're talking about like security and we're talking about bypassing all these security controls and if I was gonna be evil, we have to understand what the hell the cloud is. Now, I got this, um, I got this, yeah, the cloud. It's this cloud thing. Sure. Um, it's funny, whenever people are talking about the cloud, it's a series of distributed computer systems working to, collect, to, collect, to collectively achieve a common goal. I'm like, oh, so it's like a botnet then. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not a botnet. It's a bunch of computers that do things like a botnet. <laughs> you know, not a botnet. Um, but it's funny, I have these vendors they send me these things from time to time, and I, I've got to find this one, and I, and I shouldn't be, uh, I shouldn't be trying to find it on my phone while I'm doing this, so I'm trying to find words that go out of my mouth. Oh, here we go. So this came from Nate Vack. Um, he's the Central USA Senior Man Account Manager for UMBOVC. You know what OVC? Yeah, you know me. Uh, dot com, and uh, he sends me this email. He goes, hello there. By way of introduction, I'm Nate Vack with UMBOCV. We're one, we're one stop shop for integrators. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> we integrate things, okay? I would love to set up a time to talk about a stat, how we stack up against the competition of <laughs> random integrators. Yeah, Bill. Are you reading your email to you? I'm reading my email to you, but it gets better. Wait, sit, just for a second. <laughs> All right, can you get that man some more of that horrible crap that's melted licorice and Satan's ass sweat? <laughs> Our product's artificial intelligence is unlike anything you've seen. It has gotten us mentioned in the Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, and Dow Jones. What does the Dow Jones talk about these things? You know, it's like, oh, look at the ticker, it's talking to me. <laughs> right? And he says, this weekend received something in a blow, and I said, hey, that's a lot of buzzwords, son. Um, you might want to talk to me some more about some of those things. And he goes, no, 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 thanks for the email. People really whenever you hear AI, it's something we have to laugh at, right? However, here it comes. Our cloud-first learning camera is attached to a neural network and uses deep learning to learn every second. So it's a pretty freaking slow computer, actually. <laughs> I'd love to go into more depth to change your mind. So this cloud-based learning nano, or like second learning machine language thing, you know, the cloud is freaking huge, right? I, I, you know, people talk about the cloud, and I'm like, well, it's out on the internet. And the internet is freaking evil, let's be honest, it is. And, and if you look at the total percentage of what's good on the internet versus what's bad, I think it's roughly 98% evil, maybe 2% good. And people are like, well, I think there's good things out there. Like, 
I can buy handbags. And is anybody here do network IDS or network flow analysis on their network? We got some people that do that. How much traffic in your network is dedicated to handbags? Seriously, look at it. Look at the traffic. It's gigabytes a day of freaking handbags, right? For me, that's evil, right? But the cloud is huge. I and mean, whenever people are trying to set up their solutions to stop evil people, they basically do blacklisting of the internet. They're like, well, that node right there is evil. That one's evil. I don't know what those are, so we're going to allow those in. And those are evil over there. It's huge. It's really, really, really massive. And all I need to do to get onto your network is have a command and control that's not listed as evil. And then I can bypass a lot of security technologies. So the point is, the users will always click things. We've got to find a way to get around that, right? We've got to be prepared for that eventuality that's going to occur at some point. So let's move on. And I'm realizing that I'm missing slides here. It's like, where the hell are my slides? Which slides I need to bypass? Here we go. My slides are completely and utterly out of order. So I'm going to jump around. We're going to jump over this, and then we're going to move to cluster bam. Uh, we'll just stick with whatever was at. It's not, a, not that big of a deal. As you can tell, I got prepared for this presentation. It's not like Bill and, and, and Corey haven't been asking me to come here for like months. I really wish he would have written his slides like at least sometime earlier than 15 <laughs> minutes before the presentation. So moving on beyond users, okay? So we know that users are going to click things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about antivirus bypass. I'm gonna talk about um, out, attacking Outlook web access portals. If, if your organization uses Outlook web access portals and you don't use two-factor authentication, you're gonna get popped. I'm sorry. Um, it's very, very easy to take over those accounts. And I know those people are like, well, challenge, accept it. You're gonna lose, okay? Outlook web access without two-factor is very easy to break into. I'm gonna talk about software-defined radio. Currently working with a, a friend of mine on his book, He's putting a lot of time into it. In the whole entire book series, it's actually four books on learning software to find radio. Basically gets to the point where you can hack the key fobs for cars and you can hack garage door openers. So you can go to somebody's house, they push the button, you intercept that, and then you can replay it actually after they leave. Um, and you can save it down to a file. So I'll talk about that. And then I'll also talk about a VPN zero day. And I'm totally not reusing these slides at all. <laughs> no, 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 no. There. See, I did these slides custom for you guys. All right, there we go. So it's not a huge VPN zero day, but I want to talk through how a VPN zero day looks if it doesn't involve a buffer overflow or deep spring overflow or those types of things. So let's jump into attacking Outlook web access. Every freaking pen test we do, organizations have Outlook web access. They use it absolutely everywhere. And if we can gain access to organizations' emails, directly. We can then send emails, do password resets, and then the systems administrators will be able to click this link to reset your password. Like, okay, we'll do that for you. And we can take over that. Um, so this is awesome. So one of the problems with trying to break into Outlook web access portals is tools like Hydra are horrible at this. The reason why they're horrible is because they don't handle redirects really, really well. So if you go to a page and then it redirects you to another page or another page, Hydra kind of pukes all over itself and it's like, well, they all failed. You could literally give it a valid user ID and a valid password and let it run for hours with just that valid user ID and password and it still wouldn't get in because it's not going to properly handle the redirects whenever you're trying to do a password spraying attack. So we're going to talk about a solution to that. But what can you do once you have access? Well, there's tons of cool things once I get access to email in organizations. So we're going to talk about Burp Intruder, and then we're going to talk about Cluster Bomb um, here in just a little bit. So what we do um, with this, let me jump up on stage here, because this will be easier. So whenever you're using Burp, you can find an entry point that you want to fuzz, all right? So with Burp Intruder, I'd say, this point right here is of interest to me. That's where we're looking at the user ID, all right? So we can harvest a bunch of valid user IDs. We can harvest those user IDs using something like PwnList. We can go to Pastebin. We can search for the domain and see if there's any passwords that are out there. We want to harvest a whole bunch of user IDs. You can, we got LinkedIn modules and ReconNG. That's a whole other conversation. But I harvest the valid user accounts for an organization. And then I can specify a specific point that I want to put those user IDs into. And here it's just a simple putting in a password. Testing, one, two, three. 
And then we can feed in our list of all the valid user IDs that we were able to harvest. Many times we can pull this down by looking at the emails we get from this organization. Like let's say it's just strand.js. All right, well we know that it's last name, first initial, last initial. We have an idea of how the user IDs are actually specified. So here we can specify the target org, that would be the domain, slash, and we say this point right here, this is the one we want to fuzz and the one that we wish to attack, all right? Then on Burp, we select a little button that says we want you to follow the redirects on site only. So we wanted to follow those redirects. So whenever we're attacking Outlook Web Access, whenever you give a successful login, it's going to move you to a 302 redirect that's going to move you to another part of the website. We wanted to follow those redirects, and we want to collect the information associated with the page that it eventually lands on as well. So this is what it looks like when we're, val we're harvesting valid user IDs, all right? So we got a whole bunch of user IDs here, okay? We got the status is always 200, which is part of the reason why Hydra has issues. Whenever you're trying to make a request to a web page and you get a 200, it's like, well, that was fine. It wasn't like a 404 not found or a 500 error or anything like that. It comes back and it says, yes, the request was okay, we've got that. But notice the length is different. You can see here that we have a whole bunch of 4370s. We got 4371, 4371. All of these are successful logins, all right? All of these that are 12994 are failed logins. Now, how does this work, though? Because I'm using a valid user ID. How can I actually get access to that by only knowing user IDs? How the hell does that work? Well, what happens is we do something called password spraying. See, whenever most people think of password attacks, what they do is they'll try thousands, millions of passwords against a valid user ID. In most of your organizations, whenever this is done, it's going to lock out accounts. We bypass that by only using one password at a time for the user accounts. So what are some passwords you think that would be heavily used in organizations? Passwords, passwords one, two, three. Company name, one, two, three. The best one by far in almost every assessment we do, season, year. Why does that work? It's easy to remember, and how often do you have to change your passwords? About that often, right? It's like, well, what was my password? It's winter, so it's winter 2016. Um, and you know what that password is. So you use a password of winter 2016, and then you password spray, or user spray, against all of the different accounts, and then you harvest all of the accounts that you gain access to. Usually whenever we're testing and we're doing this, the hardest part of the test is sifting through the freaking email of all the people that you gain access to with this. So it's a very, very easy approach to try to gain access to systems remotely. Now, what you can do, because some organizations will disable account lockout remotely. Excuse me, and that makes sense. If it's on a web server, you don't necessarily want to have account lockout going because they can lock out your entire domain. Um, but even at that, we try to restrict the number of passwords we use. We have winter 15, winter 16, fall 2015, to January 2016, January 16, December 2015, password 123, winter 123, and we've got like 10 different passwords there. Now, whenever we use cluster bomb, we can specify multiple points that we're fuzzing. So we can say, here's a bunch of user IDs, and then I want you to fuzz this parameter, which says password, I want you to fuzz password with a separate list. So now we have two separate lists that we're spraying against the organization, and we get even more user IDs and passwords whenever we're trying to break into an account. All right, so let's say that I get a bunch of valid user IDs and passwords. Many times we will then get access to um, Citrix environments. You have Citrix desktops, so then we can log into systems, or we'll find remote desktop, or we can use a spear phishing campaign. You'd be surprised how good a spear phishing campaign says, Bill. Your password is winter 2016. You need to change that crap immediately. Damn it! Click this link it. right now and change it. Like, oh, I'm going to change my password. <laughs> they click it. Once again, that's not usually something that Apple guys fall for because they, they're like, I'm immune to those types of attacks. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about AV bypass. I, I was going to do an entire presentation on this, but it gets old after a while, and you really piss off antivirus vendors after a while. And it's not that that's a problem, it just grows tiresome. 
Um, DerbyCon last year, they made the mistake, actually I don't think Dave Kennedy set this up as a mistake, I'm pretty sure he did this intentionally. He put our booth directly across the, the, the little open space from Symantec's booth. And the Symantec guys were talking, it's like our next threat, next generation APT threat detection tool version 15 artificial intelligence machine learning is one of the most cutting edge products on the market today. So we just put out a continuous loop of us bypassing that product. Um, he got really pissed off about that for no good reason. I'm like, they just don't seem to be good sports about it. Um, and I'm going to talk more about stunt hacking here in just a little bit. I'm going to pick on McAfee for a little bit and we'll talk about other AV engines as well. And kind of what's actually going on under the hood with a lot of these things. So if you try to drop in a stream interpreter and you drop it onto a system with McAfee, they'll, they'll, they'll detect it. And the reason why they detect it is because they gotta do something to stop the 99.9% .9 of pen testing firms that are out there today. You know, the big five consulting firms are like, well, I know how to use Metasploit. I watched some videos online. And we're gonna try to get this crap to run on that system. And it doesn't work because they honestly don't know what the hell they're doing ever in any circumstance. Um, and that's not entirely true, I need to back up. There are some really fantastic security professionals in Big Five Consulting Firms. The problem is that you find out whenever you're dealing with the pen test puppy mill industrial complex is that these organizations may have brilliant people working for them, but those pen testers are working four or five pen tests at the exact same freaking time. So even if they want to do something awesome, they're like, well, I've got like six other Nessus reports I gotta convert over to Word doc format. I gotta get that, that crap in as quickly as possible. So they don't get to spend as much time as they should trying to make stuff work. So this doesn't work, and they're like, you're secure because McAfee caught Meterpreter. So <laughs> if it works, it looks like this. So we have this little warning that pops up, and it's like, bad thing on your computer system. Do you want me to restart now? Where would you like me to restart later? I love that question. So let's say we want to bypass it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something called ghost writing. And whenever we talk about gross writing, a lot of times people dive underneath tables, start sucking their thumbs, and they're like, the dark place, the dark place. Because we're going to take an executable and we're going to disassemble that executable, okay? And that sounds like really leak crap. Like, you're like, oh my god, this guy's like really freaking good. Uh, if he's disassembling things and he's messing with assembly. No, don't, don't get impressed. You can do this, it's very, very easy. The first thing that we use is we use MSF Venom to specify a payload. We say Windows Interpreter Reverse TCP. We put in the L host that we want it to connect back to, the port we want it to connect back to. The outboard format is gonna be raw, and we're gonna kick it into a file called definitely malware. And we do that just to make it easy, right? We're like, is that the malware? Yeah, that's definitely the malware. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> And then we're going to disassemble it. We do Ruby user share metasploit framework lib metasm samples disassemble.rb definitely malware into definitely malware.asm. It just kicks out the assembly and then we're good. Now, whenever you open that file in the text editor of your choice, which is always VI, all right? If you're ever, if you're here <laughs> and you're ever interviewing, do we have any new people that are students that want to get into the InfoSec security career field? Okay, we got some new people here, fantastic. All right, so a little bit of a heads up. If somebody asks you what your favorite text editor is, there's only two answers that are respectable. The first answer is VI, because that's the same answer. And if you like VI, are you a pirate or a ninja? Ninja! Because a ninja only brings what they need. And VI does what it does, and it does it fantastically well. You can also say Emacs, and all the people in the room will start moving slowly back from you to the door. But that's the pirate tool, right? God, more ass Why do you close Emacs? Wait, 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 wait. You shoot your computer. So we have a tradition here at SecKC. If this is the first time that you've talked to SecKC, you gotta take a shot. So John Strand is here for him. Thank God I can stumble back to the hotel room. <laughs> Here, let me shake my cord. Shake it one three times. <laughs> then I'm just playing with it. No, no, sir, just stand right there. It's about this point it starts working. All right. <laughs> so what you do with the assembly is you go down to this function right here. Okay, we got load SP, comp AL, and we got shit. I don't even know what that means, but it doesn't matter, okay? You find that function. That function and only 
that function. You scroll down, it's like right in the top, and you put a single no-op right there. Now, a no-op is, is hex 9.0 in Intel, and it basically tells your CPU no operation, which is a lie. It actually does something. It copies a register from itself to itself. That's a long story. But just know that it does nothing, all right? One single freaking no-op right there. So we got load SB comp AL 61H, no-op, JLOC 25H, one little no-op, and then you recompile the executable. So we're going to do Ruby, user share, metasploit framework, lib, meta, same sample, peen code, RB, definitely malware. We're going to output it as might be malware? <laughs> we save that out, and it works. Woo! <laughs> AV gives no shits about it. It's like, well, you look good. <laughs> you got that no-op smile, and we're going to let you in. Everything is fine. Um, and, and it's just going to work, and, and Acme's going to allow it. Um, but it's not just McAfee, it's a whole crap load more. Yeah, one no up. And what's funny <laughs> is a lot of AV vendors are like, oh, 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 we got your number. We're going to catch that. If they catch it, two no put two no ops in there. <laughs> if they're still catching it, put in three, and eventually they're just going to lose it. Um, now, why does this matter? This matters a lot to everybody in this room because we're IT security professionals. All the crap that I'm talking about is a little bit of stunt hacking, and I want to explain later why that's important. We need to be able to do this, and we need to be able to do this effectively all the damn time. Because when your vendors show up, they're like, the cost for our antivirus suite is gonna be one billion T dollars. And like, I bypassed it in two seconds. The cost for our AV suite is now $100,000. Now we're talking. Um, now we're talking. We can, it doesn't matter what the vendor is. If it's FireEye, there's ways to bypass FireEye. And there's ways to bypass FireEye that have been documented for five years. And FireEye's like, I'm too busy rolling in money to give a shit. So I'm not going to do anything to try to remedy that situation. Palo Alto as well, and, you know, there's ways to bypass. And I love the guys at Palo Alto. The guys at Palo Alto are awesome. Whenever we bypass their product, they listen to us like, we've got to fix that. And then they try to fix it, and they're actually working towards it, but there's ways to bypass those products. Uh, Carbon Black um, Bit 9, if you exploit a system with that, and you migrate into the process with the interpreter, migrate the process ID of Carbon Black or Bit 9, it goes completely blind. Because it can't watch itself. It's just like, well, I don't know what's going on. You're on its head. It's like, where's the malware? And it can't watch itself, watching itself, watch itself. So it doesn't. We send in bug reports to these vendors, and they're like, the response is literally, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> no, hey, let's fix that. They're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to us. <laughs> You're like, it's broken. Yep. <laughs> so we need to constantly be pushing the bounds to get these people to fix these things. And they may have fixed it in the past couple of weeks. Hell, what do I know? Um, another way that you can bypass AV engines, um, I, I love this. Um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite examples of all freaking time. Most antivirus engines are not detecting the malware itself. Whenever you create malware from Metasploit and you drop it out into ROM, um, you can encode it with things like Shikata Ganai, which is Japanese for there's nothing that can be done about it. You've got a bunch of different encoders that can exist. That wasn't a joke. That's literally what it means. <laughs> These guys need shots as well. Um, yes! What most AV engines are detecting, they're actually detecting the template. Now let me explain that. Whenever you create malware with Metasploit, it takes a template file, template.exe, and it inserts its malware inside of template.exe. AV vendors look at that problem, and they're like, well, what we really need to do is just write a signature for template.exe, and then they high-five each other, right? So all we really need to do is alter template.exe, and conveniently enough, Metasploit comes with template.c, so you can get the C code. Now, you can open this up in like Visual Studio, and this gets a little weird, because a lot of people will compile their code with Metasploit using things like GDB, and if you can move it to a different compiler, it completely changes the entire signature. So what we did, and this is Brian that actually did this one, the other one was done by Bull Bullock and was also done by Steve Sims. We can do initialize x to zero. We, right here, just right where we're starting the function, inside the C code. We add an initialize x to zero, initialize y to 10, initialize z to x plus y. This blows through almost every AV engine. That's right, math blows through antivirus engines. 
It's just like, oh, screw that. And no one told us there would be math involved. Um, and you compile it in a different compiler, and away it goes. Um, is anybody here into Golang, using Go as a language, actually starting to write things in Go? Come on, there's going to be somebody. I know there's like one dude. This guy right here, you're using Go. Awesome. That's awesome. Go is an awesome language. You have a radio that makes me hella uncomfortable. <laughs> Bill and Trent taught me just how bad that can actually be. Um, do you know where this fits? I'm like, I don't know. An hour later, I knew. Um, so, so, so when, the cool thing about Golang, there's a couple, there's a bunch of things that are awesome about Golang. Google got a whole bunch of C developers, and I mean like the people that develop C, not people that develop in C, the people that wrote the freaking language. Not C++, because those people should be shot. But the people that developed C, got them in a room, they're like, if you started from scratch, what would you do? And they whiteboarded everything they would do for a new language to make it a lot easier to use, and you know, threading, multi-threading was built in. You could do load balance, all kinds of fun stuff. All of it was built in. And then Google said, here's a blank check, go write your new language. And they did. And it's awesome, and it's beautiful, and, it, and it's, it's just great. If you write your malware in Go, most AV engines have no idea how to approach Golang executables. They look at it and they're like, oh, screw that, out, done. They, no idea whatsoever. So learning how to change your C code, learning how to modify things, even slightly, is enough to bypass many AV engines as well. So the lesson on this is, once again, the attackers will constantly be attacking your entry points. Your user is going to click on links. You're going to get command and control. Basically, you're going to get compromised. If your entire security architecture is based around the principle of stopping the bad guy from getting in in the first place, your security architecture sucks. If your entire security architecture is built in such a way that you cannot detect an insider, a standard insider user that's doing something malicious, your security architecture sucks. Because an insider threat, somebody that's maliciously causing you harm intentionally inside of your organization, is indistinguishable from an attacker that has taken over that account. So that is one of the big things that we're trying to get across here. Your security components that you rely on, your firewall and AV are going to fail. Knowing that, what do you do next? What do you do next? So that's the lesson to learn from this one. So let's talk a little bit about a really kind of just goofy, like zero day. Um, so this is a VPN, it's called Fat Pipe, all right? And we had a number of customers that were using this VPN, and uh, they, you know, a lot of people, it's like, you can't break into our network. Why? We use SSL. And it's like, you know, God is like, Whoa! Or a VPN. Stand back from the VPN, boys and girls, because there's encryption. It's virtual, it's private, and it's a network. Stand back right now. So we had a customer that was using this for a whole bunch of different things. And they asked us to take a look at it. But it's always a, a kind of a, a, a crapshoot. Whenever somebody asks you, they're like, hey, could you write like an exploit for one of our products? And it's kind of weird to do that because it takes a lot of time. And there's no, it's, it's a non-deterministic kind, of, uh, kind of tactic and approach. If you're pen testing, it's almost 100%, if the scope is set up correctly, that a good pen testing firm or a targeted attacker is going to get it. They can absolutely do that effectively. Okay? But if somebody's like, hey, can you write an exploit for something? You're like, ah, I think so. It might take three weeks, it might take a month, but it's always time bound and it's somewhat difficult. But sometimes whenever you're looking at products, it makes it very easy. Now I want to make it very clear, we've been contacting these people for months and they're not responding. In fact, we're pretty sure the company's out of business. Um, so we feel pretty good about talking about this publicly now, is using it as a case study. We're gonna have a long one hour uh, webcast where we're gonna talk through step by step our approach, how we attack these types of things, so that people can start doing this type of attack and these types of approaches in their networks as well. So this is originally found by Joff, a member of Security Weekly and also a member of BHIS. So let's go through and let's talk about the attack methodology. All right, <laughs> can anybody find the problem in this code? The key, it took like two seconds, mainly because I highlighted it. But it's there, right? So, you have two fish algorithm, and two fish was written by who? Bruce Schneier. Bruce Schneier, right? Now, Bruce Schneier has a great quote. Somebody asked him at a con, is there ever any crypto that you haven't been able to crack? And Bruce Schneier's response was priceless. 
because it was one of the Bruce Snyder quotes that wasn't completely dickish. Um, but he responded back and he said, you never attack crypto directly. You always attack the implementation of the crypto. Always attack the implementation, not the crypto itself. So in the source code that we were able to get access to, um, we have the key is two fish algorithm, make key, and then we have this key. It's a static key. It's in every single installation. So a good implementation of crypto is every time you instantiate a new client or a new server, use certificate-based encryption, use public key cryptography. Um, you generate random keys for every single user, and that randomness is very, very important. Where's the guy? Yeah, come on, up, 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 shake, 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 shake. Here we go! There we go, that's awesome. He shook it for me. It's not weird at all. All right. Just once, <laughs> therefore it's okay. Um, so we have we have the key. Now let's talk a little bit about cr cracking crypto. Now, whenever we're talking to companies, many times whenever we do crypto assessments, crypto analysis, once again the engineers will get us in a room and they're going to say things like, "You're not going to break our crypto because we're using AES," and like we're supposed to wilt and like fall back into the corner. Um, so. <laughs> If we're looking at something like AES, once again, you never attack AES directly, but rather what you're going to do is you're going to attack the implementation of AES. Now, a little bit of background on what AES is. AES is a block mode cipher. It's different than a stream mode cipher. Stream mode cipher, every single bit is going to be encrypt, encrypted in, as a stream, right? So if you're looking at the cipher text and the plain text, it's gonna be the exact same size. Whenever you're looking at a block cipher, like AES, it's gonna use 16. 16 byte blocks, okay? So we have these blocks that it's going to encrypt, all right? Now, how it encrypts those blocks is very, very important, all right? There's a number of different modes for AES to work. One of the modes entails taking one block and then using that as a key to encrypt the next block, and then using that block as a key to encrypt the next block, and so on. That's pretty good. The wrong thing is to use electronic codebook mode, all right? So electronic codebook mode is where you use AES, but you use the exact same key for every block of ciphertext that's created. It's the exact same key. So if you were to encrypt an image and you were trying to view that image, you could actually see the image. It kind of looks like really jarbled black and white, but you can actually see images. You can do this in some situations like illegal porn cases, or if it's encrypted with uh, electronic codebook mode, you can actually see like kind of an outline of what the image actually is. You can determine what that actually would be. Now, when you're dealing with something like a VPN, where all blocks are equal, and if you want to be super cool in information security, get this shirt. The other shirt that you can get is this one, uh, the Grace shirt from the NSA. That's an awesome shirt, by the way. If you want really advanced crypto nerds to like be like, I want to party with that guy. This is one of those shirts. Because it says electronic codebook mode, all blocks are equal, all right? So every block is equal. So if we have the key, we can feed in our blocks. Here we have block one, block two, block three, block four, block five, block six, block seven. We can feed in the blocks of the encrypted text, and then we can decode it with the key that we establish up here. Now, once we feed that program through, we get the clear text. So we have the client has nothing, the server responds back with a version 522R10. Once again, if we're able to encrypt the server coming back with its version, that's a bad VPN. The client sends AAA, the server responds back with number four, the client sends back AA0. We're seeing the clear text of what's being sent back and forth in the kind of the initialization handshake of the VPN working. So what's the lesson to learn from this if we're trying to figure out what the hell this actually means? If we're looking at buffers, buffer overflows and heap spraying attacks, you're really only seeing a very small percentage of what the overall surface of, like the attackable surface of a network looks like, okay? Security is shifting, okay? It's not just an issue of trying to fuzz a whole bunch of parameters, finding a vulnerability whenever you crash, looking at EIP, and then trying to set the return pointer and taking over the system. Those types of vulnerabilities are very hard to find. It, it, that they should qualify that. Some software developers shut off all security protections. Uh, they don't use the GS flag whenever they compile their code. And that makes things a lot easier. But if you look at the protections that Microsoft Windows offers you, 
Whenever you're looking at data execution prevention, prevention, you're looking at canaries protecting the return pointer, you're looking at structured exception handling and registering safe SEH and threads and processes that actually say these are the memory addresses we can go to. Actually, Microsoft Windows has a very good security model. So does Linux. So trying to attack modern operating systems with, and trying to attack applications that take advantage of those protections is actually very, very hard. But if we can get at the source code and we can start looking at the functionality of how something actually works, well, the calculation changes rather dramatically. See, we've got to start looking beyond what everybody else is looking for all the time. And that's the only way that we're going to start improving. And yes, this is something that is many times referred to as stunt hacking. You go to presentations and people that I absolutely respect and people like Chris Nickerson. No, I, I love Chris, sorry. <laughs> I love Chris Nickerson. There's a lot of people that say that stunt hacking is an absolute joke and it should not happen. I believe that that's wrong. I believe that things like stunt hacking and doing things like this are opening a portal and they're showing the rest of us the way that we can start assessing our applications, our protocols. It's not about the specific vulnerability, but it's about how it was discovered and what that vulnerability entails and trying to find those same mistakes in our applications. So that's kind of setting that up a little bit. So let's talk about moving on a little bit further. Lately, we've been spending a lot of time doing software-defined radio. Has anybody here been playing with GNU radio and software-defined radio? Isn't it ridiculous? The whole community, do you remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, whenever you first started writing exploits, there was all these shadowy websites, and you know, if you tried to get knowledge, all the people were very closed off. You'd be like, well, I'd like to get some shell code that opens up a listener on port 4444. They'd be like, screw you, noob. And you're like, who oh, noob? Or you'd have somebody that would give you shell code, and it would be like hacks. It'd be slash xaf, slash xcf, slash x00, slash xff, slash xff, slash xc2. It'd be this long string of hacks. It would be like four megs. They're like, well, this opens up a shell port 4444. And you're like, does it really need to be four megs long? Just run it. <laughs> it's totally legit. And you're like, what the hell? How do I trust this guy? Um, whenever you're dealing with software-defined radio, it's a lot like that. So you have people that come out, and when we're working in GNU radio, you have these flow graphs. And trying to get the flow graphs is like pulling teeth from people. You can get flow graphs for an AM radio, an FM radio, but that that's pretty much it, right? Once you start trying to do other things, it's an absolute freaking nightmare. So as I mentioned earlier, is somebody like pulling up a cappuccino in the back or something? <laughs> so I wheeled in my tire and I'm flattening it. Why? <laughs> okay. Um, so trying to get involved in software-defined radio is a pain in the ass. So a friend of mine is releasing a book here shortly that's walking through step-by-step -step how to attack software, uh, attack like radio signals, right? And I want to walk through some of the things that's coming out in that book and some of the things that are going to be released because we've been doing tech editing of it. So this particular example is a garage door opener, all right? So whenever you're looking at software-defined radio, think of everything as a spectrum. I want you to think of your radio dial or I want you to think of your piano, right? You have lower values on the left, you have higher values on the right. You're moving up and down the FM dial, you're moving up and down the AM dial and so on. So what you can do, is you can do a full capture of a specific slice of spectrum. Here we're going from 303 megahertz to 317 megahertz. And you can see right here that whenever I push a button on a garage door opener, just, just a garage door opener, you push a button on the garage door opener, we see a spike at 315 megahertz, right? Now, a lot of people, whenever they're doing software-defined radio attacks, they can see this and they can capture it. They're like, that's pretty. Um, but then you get into a lot of problems about what type of keying is being used. Is it using phase shifting keys? Is it using OK? How is it actually being approached? And I want to walk through kind of some things on what this actually looks like. And you guys will be able to do this here shortly because these books are being released. And there's going to be all the flow graphs and all the things associated with it to get people started to do this type of hacking on their own. We do a lot of this whenever we're doing embedded device security assessments. We do it with uh, power grid assessments. Um, you know, you have somebody that's like, well, don't worry, this particular product has its own proprietary protocol and no one's been able to hack it. You can attack it then. Um, so in this example, it's a garage door opener. Most garage door openers run at 300, 315, or 319 megahertz. There's no encryption being used at all. You can basically intercept, you set up the right key, and then you're able to output to a WAV file. Yes, it comes back as an audio file. Convert that into a binary file and then play it back. So, can this be frustrating? Oh, hell yeah. 
um, this is a nightmare, right? Like whenever you're trying to set these things up, if you don't know what you're doing, you just, you're just like, there's some kind of dark magician in a room that sets these things up. So whenever you're working with GNU Radio, you specify a series of different variables up here, all right? You specify the variables, like what is the frequency you're going to look at? What is the, uh, like if you're gonna put it in a high pass, low pass filter, what are gonna be the frequencies that you're going to filter out? You also have GUI entries. That last slide I showed you is actually a GUI. It pops up, you can take the default variable and you can change the variable and you can move things around. So we have a GUI entry. Then you start chaining this crap together. So we put in the input source, this is actually a file input source. We put in threshold, we put in frequency algorithms and the, and the different types of filters that are going to be used. You send it through a bunch of different things like GUIs, and then you can do things where you actually kick it out to like binary slicer to try to slice out the binary data on that specific 315 megahertz spectrum. So this is what it looks like when you push your garage door opener. So you push your garage door opener, one, two, one, two, and you're able to see what is actually being sent in the frequencies. Now anytime you're trying to do software-defined radio attacks, you're picking up junk everywhere. So you can see that we have some, some like data here. Believe it or not, that was the HVAC in my office building. What if we shut off the fans? That went away. Because you have radio frequencies all over the place all the time. So you're looking for these little spikes. You can basically create the stimulus and the response, and you can see these little spikes that exist. So then you create a filter around 315 megahertz, and then you grab that specific section of those bytes as they come through, and you look for ones and zeros. Now, I skipped a lot of steps to get to this point. <laughs> I want to make that very, very, very clear. The book that actually does this is 350 pages long. Because if you're looking at the button spikes, it is a nice little, <laughs> like, like, you square wave. It, it doesn't, it's like spikes and it sucks, okay? But you can actually go through a bunch of things to clean that up, and this book goes through everything that's going to be coming out. So we have a zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one. All right? And this is the actual code that is being sent in the garage door opener to open up your garage door. Now there's some things on the front of this that I cut off. One of the things you'll see a lot whenever you're working with software-defined radio is you'll see 16 ones in a row. And then you'll see a whole bunch of zeros, and then you'll see 16 ones in a row. And then you may see a 1010101010. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. That's basically so it can say the bandwidth of how much bandwidth denotes a bit for one or a bit for zero. So here you can actually see that being sent. Now, another problem with a lot of software-defined radio hacking is how do you convert that wave file into a binary file that you can play back? So one of the things that we're going to release, and one of the things that David is going to release, is this wonderful little script that's called wave to bin So it'll take that waveform file, convert it into a binary file, then you can read that file back, and you can play it, and you can open up somebody's garage door. Um, the same thing for garage door also applies for the key fobs on your car to unlock your car or remotely start your car as well. So what's going to happen here very shortly is you're all of a sudden going to see a whole bunch of GNU radio enthusiasts that are going to be equipped with the tools to break into any garage door in America or in Europe or any car in America as well. What do you think that's going to do and what do you think that's going to change as far as security is concerned across the board? I think it's going to change things. <laughs> People are going to go back to keys. You know what? I'm okay with that. I've never once gotten in a car and been like, you know what I hate about cars? People are like, yeah, keys. Freaking keys. I hate keys. If I had a key fob that I could like have in my pocket and my car knows that I have it, that would be awesome. And then I could leave it in my car and then lock it in the car whenever I go away and then I'd still have to use a key. That would be awesome. No. Yeah, I'd love to go back to keys. But what I do think it's, huh? How do rolling codes work? How do rolling codes? Whenever you're looking at the rolling codes, you have to look at the key shifting. Like I said, phase key shifting, or OOK, you can actually identify what type of shifting algorithm is being used, or phase shifting key algorithm is being used, and then you can attack it as well. And that's going to be covered in this book. The rolling codes are very, very, very easy to attack as well. Because many times whenever they're dealing with rolling codes, they say random, but it's actually sequential. They're actually moving it up. Because they go the easiest possible vector. So all you need is a book, a couple of flow graphs. If you guys want some of these graphs, bring me up a USB stick. You can totally trust me. <laughs> and I'll give you some flow graphs. Fair? Deal. All right. So these are the things that I'm talking about because of one specific reason. Security is moving on. 
Um, if you look at information security as strictly an exercise in operating system security, you're five to ten years behind the curve. If you're looking at information security as strictly a game of web application security, you're, well, okay, so that's still pretty damn correct. Um, you find <laughs> SQL injection everywhere, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, business logic errors, all of these different things. You're still very, very current. But unfortunately, a lot of the vendors and people that are selling you products are trying to sell you products for operating system level security issues, right? Because it's easy. If you're a vendor, and I'm entering into this pool, so please have mercy on my soul. Um, if you're moving into the, into the market, and you're trying to sell a product, and you're trying to sell a product that impacts Windows operating systems, there's millions of billions of systems that are available for you to sell to. If you're moving into web application security products, that's a tough market, right? Anybody here try to implement a web application firewall? <laughs> Great, I see no hands going up, we failed. Right? Most people that try to do that run screaming from the experience because it's very hard because our web applications are highly customized. So we have these problems that exist, right? But if you're, if you're new and you're just getting started and you're one of these new people in information security today and you want to differentiate, get into these new things. Embedded device security. Um, you know, Corey's walking around with a, with a flashing thing. I haven't seen it flash very much lately. Um, know how to use a Raspberry Pi. Do some basic programming. Bring him up. Yeah, we should bring him up. Bring him see. up. Corey, come up. <laughs> Dance, Corey, dance! <laughs> no, just stay where you're at. I'll come back and drink with you here in just a little bit. But information security is moving on, and you need to find these areas where it's actually moving on. The Internet of Things is something that makes my stomach turn, but it is something that it's, information security is moving on to. And these are the things you need to start looking at. So if you stand here and we just shout out as people type How does that in. work? That's a Raspberry Pi. What do we have to do to make that talk? Well, you need to tweet the, uh, wait, how do you, who was here earlier for 101? How do you get this to work? <laughs> well, I think there's a little social engineering involved, actually. <laughs> it said, fuck you, Corey! <laughs> yeah, well, guess what? Back at you, friend. Magnets? <laughs> magnets and dirt? How do those work? <laughs> yeah. Underneath scientists and doctors? Hashtag SecKC! Hashtag SecKC, so if you tweet, and then hashtag SecKC, you will show up on this badge. Okay, there we go. So what is it saying now? Has anyone... I love watching people read this. Look at all ...to the cyber police what? yet. Wait, what? That was a horrible hashtag mention. Yeah, whoever did that, take your beer. We, yeah. we, we denied your beer. <laughs> That's it, you've had enough. Okay, we're cutting you off. Strand said cyber! I said cyber. Strand said cyber, we need a shot, stat. Shot for everybody! I, I, wait a minute. Hey, if you that's say, not, that's if not you say cyber, we say cyber. Shots! Shot! APT. Shots? <laughs> Waiting. Okay, maybe later. All right. So the core thing is on this entire presentation is I want you to stop me. And one of the things that we're pushing so very hard in information security today, in Security Weekly, and what I'm teaching at SANS, and what I'm doing at Black Hills Information Security, is we're trying to get people to go off of the uh, standard information security stuff that exists. AV, IDS, IPS, firewalls. And it's one of the things that bothers me. I give presentations like this, and somebody will come up to me and be like, so, great presentation, that's awesome. So what firewall do you recommend? It's like, you completely missed the point. Um, it, it's not about the specific tools that you're being, that you're using. So look at things like app locker and software restriction policies, long passwords, two-factor authentication, firewall everything, down to the workstation. Turn on your workstation's firewalls. McAfee, Symantec, Sophos, these guys have firewalls. Turn them on now. You're going to stop me from laterally moving around inside your network. Internet whitelisting, many people are like, we can't implement internet whitelisting. Um, one of the favorite things that I've seen in a long time is the concept of a splash screen. So every month it resets. Somebody goes to a website like Google and it gives them a splash screen. It says, this website is currently blocked. You are the first person this month to go to this website. If you wish to allow this website for you and everyone else, click allow. Otherwise, click deny. 
<laughs> you do that in your environment. You put that in control of your users. Believe it or not, it's going to be very, very hard to get out of your network. Not impossible, but it's going to be very, very, very hard. Your overall security posture, if you implement something like that, where you let the inmates run the asylum, versus your blacklisting approach that you have today, what do you think is more secure? Splash screen, by an infinite amount. The number of websites that you allow will be far, will be far, far, far reduced compared to the blacklist approach that you have. So that's a whole other presentation, but it works really, really well. Regularly test things, and then the big thing is, assume you will be compromised and then plan accordingly for that compromise. This is a weird thing to tell people, but I'm oftentimes telling people today, be okay with the fact that you're going to be compromised. I know that that's a horrible thing to admit. People are like, well, I don't think you should be okay with that at all. You're all okay with dying. You are. You're okay with taxes. There's all kinds of horrible things in your life that are going to occur. You're okay with those things. You're able to go out in society. You're able to function. You're able to come to Sec KC and drink. You're okay with it at some base level. At some base level, you have to be okay with the fact that you're going to be compromised. You accept it as an eventuality, something that is going to occur, and you're going to architect your environment in such a way that whenever it does occur, it doesn't create a catastrophic compromise of your entire environment. So some things to practice that I think some basic, basic, basic skills should be based upon. This is a little executable that Mark Baker created, and we've implemented it in SANS, and I give it away for free at presentations like this because I like pissing off SANS. Um, people are like, exactly how many bitcoins is a SANS training class? I'm like, a lot. I'm not sure, but it's a lot. So here's a little lab we've created. It basically runs and it says a TCP backdoor has been started on your host without connecting into it, at, identify it, and answer the following questions. What port is it listening on? So if you think you have something malicious listening on a port on your computer system, what would be the command that you would run to find that particular process that's listening on a port? Netstat what? Netstat, N-A, N-A-O-B. What does B get you? That's so very important. It gets you the process ID. Very good. So we can run Netstat minus N-A-O-B. Um, what is the process ID number of the backdoor? So that's where the N-O-A-B comes from. What is the parent process? What would be the wonderful command family that you would use that would allow you to get the parent process ID? Huh? You could run something like PS3, or you could use WMIC. Or you could actually pull the parent process ID as well. Um, whenever you use netcat connect to the port, what does it print? And it says this is the flag. The PowerShell backdoor is easy to find because of the port. Now there's another process that does not run. What is the name of that process ID? It asks you a whole bunch of questions. And then when you stop it and restart, it randomizes all the questions again. So you get this practice where you can do this again and again and again and get very good at detecting this type of malware in your organization. More practice. Um, I'm going to give you guys a link here at the uh, end of the presentation. But one of the things that we do whenever we test organizations, and we give this away for free so people can do it before we even get there, is the spreadsheet that kind of breaks down a whole bunch of different things that worked and things that didn't work. Rather than trying to do a pen test and assessment to say, yay, we successfully hacked you, or oh, wow, that sucked, we weren't able to get anywhere, we can do a scientific approach. For example, from a standard workstation, can I get command line access? Can I use tools like DNSCAT, custom malware like VS Agent, ASCII shellcode injection, 32-bit encoded malware, plain text credit card, C2 data exfiltration, reverse TCP port over HTTPS, non-standard TCP ports, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And you can run through these things. Just simply, simply Google these things. You're going to find step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that. And I'll give that to you guys here in just two shakes of a lamb's tail. So all of this is on a uh, tiny URL, because you can trust random links that I give you. Um, tinyurl.com, 504 Extra. So anytime I teach SANS 504, these are the extra things that I give in addition to the class. Once again, I like giving this crap out for free. Um, I don't like to just make it, well, come take the SANS class and you'll get it. No, you guys can pull this stuff down. Um, that's perfectly fine. Pull it all down. And you'll see that we have the command and control worksheet here. And if you go up, we have AV bypass scripts, um, things on active defense and finding attackers, finding lurkers with command and control, um, bypassing um, LAD's uh, capability to detect uh, alternate data streams with DIR space forward slash R using reserved file names and so on. So we have all this crap out here and you guys can pull it down. But the main one you want to look at is c2work.xls. You want to pull that down and, and actually start going through that spreadsheet at work. And you want to try to get as much of that grain as you possibly can. 
So all of this boils down to a simple note on architecture, all right? Um, as I said, a lot of this is kind of rooted in the idea of stunt hacking, and I'm going to do a little bit of defense of stunt hacking. You know, you have people that hack toasters, right? Somebody hacks a, a toaster or a fridge, and they're like, we found this zero day in this Barbie doll. And people are like, whoa, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> exploiting Barbie? I don't know. There's so many bad, dark things that we can do. And we're just going to leave that there. We're not going to go there. Um, I'll let you guys do that on your own. But the whole point of everything that we're doing today Whenever we have something like stunt hacking, whenever we have people that go through zero days, and even things like bad luck, right? Which is really SMP relay. Like whenever I read it, I'm like, well, crap. That's just that's SMP relay. Um, like you said, 08068, which is the same patch release as 08067, 08069, with Dina Dazovi and uh, K2's release of uh, Karma style attacks. So that was a good patch release for Windows. But whenever we're looking at these types of attacks that exist. As security professionals, we shouldn't look at it as a point in time vulnerability. We need to look at these types of things as architecturally, what can we learn from this vulnerability? So a special note on, on architecture. If you go back a thousand years, a room like this room would have been an architectural marble, right? The idea of having a room that would be this big without having columns all over the place would be ridiculous. It would be completely unfair. My wife is a structural engineer, and I learned whenever I'm looking at Ashto, I'm looking at low factor resistance design, I'm looking at all of these different types of architectural and structural engineering books that my wife has laying around, is I realized that structural engineering is a complete art form based on failure. All right? So structural engineers know the failure point of that door. I'm not joking. That, that door right there, a structural engineer will tell, be able to tell you exactly how much weight that door can take before it deflects, which is another way of saying failure. They'll say exactly how much weight can that column with the uh, deer head, the buck on the back, how much weight can that column take before it fails? How much weight can these trusses take before they fail? And more importantly, whenever a structural engineer designs a building, much like this one, they design it in such a way that one of these beams, if one of these trusses, sorry, one of these trusses fails, it doesn't result in a total catastrophic failure of the entire building where everyone dies. Everything in structural engineering is about failure. Everything. And they design their architectures with that failure in mind so that they have compensating components so a failure doesn't lead to death. Okay? So when we're looking at IT security and where we're at is basically going back thousands of years and somebody's building a mud hut and then some jackass named Ugg comes and kicks it down and is like, Ugg rules. And they're like, well crap, we're not going to build our huts out of mud anymore. Crap, we're going to build it out of stone, right? And then Ugg's like, well now I need a freaking elephant. And then he gets an elephant and he runs it over. That's where we're at with computer security today. Whenever we're doing stunt hacking and you guys talk about pen test jobs, you are the structural engineers today. You're finding failure points and things. And for the rest of us that may not be doing penetration testing, you need to look at these lessons that are learned and say, you know what, this attack worked for this VPN. I want to do research and try to identify, will that same type of approach work for my VPN? A buffer overflow or bypassing data execution prevention in Windows, whatever it is that you're doing, learn from these lessons of these stunt hacks and then try to do that type of testing in your own organization so that we can develop architectures that don't fail catastrophically with one user clicking a link. Because one user clicking a link is much like a trust failing in a, in a building. It shouldn't destroy your organization. So if you really want to stop somebody that goes rogue, somebody that's very good at what they do, and they're trying to attack your organization, you have to start thinking structurally. You have to start being okay with the fact that the initial compromise and trying desperately to identify ways to detect that compromise and quarantine that compromise as quickly as possible. So I want to say thank you very much for attending. Um, I, I feel bad. Uh, it, Bill has been, Bill and Corey have been inviting me out here for a long time, and um, and I'm glad that I finally made it. Uh, this is kind of a crazy period for me. I was talking to some of the guys a little bit before. Um, my mom was, stay, was, was, was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. Um, so I'm jumping down to Phoenix, Arizona to be with her um, in the process. So it's really kind of cool to get away from a lot of that and come up and be like, hey, do you guys want to, you just want to come up and drink and eat pizza? I'm like, that would be perfect. Um, that sounds like an absolutely fantastic good time. 
So thank you so much once again. Um, I appreciate it, and I will see you guys again so hopefully some point in the future. Thanks. Keep it going, John.